Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Rebecca Feverink from Goldsmiths University of London. Um, Rebecca has done some really interesting work at the intersection of HCI, machine learning, and signal processing, which is what she's going to be talking to us about today. Thanks, Lima. Yeah. Right. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about machine learning in creative practice. I'm going to touch on a lot of projects that I've done over the last seven years or so. Um, happy to take questions at any point, so feel free to interrupt. We're a small group. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about right now is the fact that we have all these sensors which are cheap, they're easy for people to use, um, they're exciting for students and hackers in many cases, and uh, often ubiquitous, like the sensors that are in your smartphones. And uh, my goal in a lot of my work is to make it easier for people to create interesting new real-time interactions with these sensors. So by real-time interaction, I just mean really broadly, hey, you've got data coming in from somewhere. Could be a sensor, could be a Twitter feed, could be a game controller, any number of things. And you want to do something with it. You want to actually control a game, or you want to build a new musical instrument where you're controlling sound synthesis as you move. Or you want to give somebody feedback about the way that they're moving and maybe guide them on how to move uh, in a better way. And I want to make this easier and faster for both professional software developers as well as end users, students, teachers, uh, musicians, and so on. And so most of my work that I'm going to talk about falls into one or more of these application areas. And I'll talk more in detail about some of the projects as we go. Um, so I mentioned I want to make this easier. I also really want to make this more accessible to people. And the key to doing that in my work is to use machine learning to use machine learning to make sense of this real-time sensor data, um, but also to rethink in that scope what, what machine learning is really good for, why it might allow us to build these kinds of systems, what kinds of systems we can build, what kinds of design processes we can support, um, and also rethinking what the user interfaces to machine learning should be to make all of that possible. OK. So, Lots of systems, like I've, I've already mentioned, new musical instruments or systems for biofeedback or for data sonification and visualization, they kind of have these three components, right? First of all, you have to get your data from somewhere. You have to, to get a sensor or an API that gives you data um, coming in. Um, then you have to make sense of that data. You have to interpret it, do some kind of decision making to figure out, all right, if my data looks like this, this is what I want my computer to do. This is what I want my game avatar to do, or this is the sound that I want my instrument to make. And then you've actually got to do that, right? There's got to be some piece of software or hardware that takes those instructions and does the thing. And in a lot of applications where I work, this data acquisition piece has become really easy, largely in part to all of these great off-the-shelf sensors, um, to people getting proficient with things like Arduino and Raspberry Pi and plugging sensors into them and making stuff. Um, and this other piece is also often really easy. Um, people who are professional musicians, for instance, they're proficient in using digital music software, where you can send it MIDI information or other control information, it'll make a sound. They know how to use that. Or game designers, they know how to program a game engine, right? That's part of what they do. Um, but this interpretation or this mapping step can be really difficult, it can be annoying, time consuming for lots of reasons, right? These sensors um, might be giving you noisy data. They might be giving you high dimensional data. They might have a rather complicated relationship between the data coming in and the thing you actually care about. Um, so unsurprisingly, this is where machine learning can come in and make things easier. Um, I'm going to unpack this a little bit. There's lots of different ways that we might interpret or map data. Um, the two that I've focused on the most are classification and regression. And we, when you talk about classification here, the easy type of application is doing something like gesture recognition. So if I have a webcam turned on and I want to do hand gestures in front of it, I might say, all right, here's something that I could do, and I want this to, to basically be an action classifier. I want it to say, that's a closed fist. Once I know that, it's easy for me to say, all right, send a, a message to my music program and have it play um, a sequence of notes, or send a message to my game engine and have my avatar do something. 
Um, and then if I do a different type of gesture, um, I get a different label, and I can produce some different response. Um, now, for most applications, you do want this classifier to be really accurate, right? You don't want it to give you the wrong label for a certain gesture, and, and people really care about that. Um, there are a number of other priorities that start coming into play, right? You might also want it to give you classifications for gestures that are comfortable for someone to, to use, that are easy for people to remember, or that are easy for people to learn. Um, and these come up, again, these are part of the design process um, uh, that I'm going to talk about a bit later. OK, on the other end of the spectrum, we might have somebody not saying, I want to trigger a bunch of different actions, um, but I want to control something continuously. Or maybe I want to control a dozen or a hundred things continuously. Um, in music, which is the domain that I'm coming from primarily, there are all sorts of really compelling applications where you want to be controlling pitch and volume and tone color and location in space. And these map onto dozens or hundreds of control parameters in your software. Obviously, there are other application areas where you also want to control many different continuous things simultaneously. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about this type of problem as a mapping problem. You're literally constructing a function which maps from some n-dimensional input space into some m-dimensional output space. Um, Right, so this guy is one of the most well-known early designers of new musical controllers, and he has these sensors, sensing systems on his hands that he used to control sound as a performer on stage. So here the challenge is slightly different, right? You don't just want something that is going to give you an accurate set of labels. You want to create an efficient, effective, high-dimensional controller, right? You want appropriate control for the task um, at hand. And this might mean that you want some accurate reproduction of a function that you have in mind. It might also mean that you want this controller to be expressive or comfortable or intuitive, whatever that means. Um, and again, this is specific often to the application and to the specific person. OK, so we've got these, these three different stages. Um, and the sensing, of course, in order to do that sensing, we need some hardware and possibly some software to get data. Um, the interpretation is this classification or mapping. And to produce the response, we can think of this as just taking those outputs from a classifier or a mapping function and sending them on to the appropriate piece of software. And usually, in most systems out there that do real-time um, control or interaction, this interpretation is a piece of software. Right? It's a piece of program code that somebody had to sit down and write. I've written this probably hundreds of times. Many of you have written these pieces of code a lot. And there's problems with this, again, especially when your data is noisy or high dimensional or you have a complicated relationship between what you're sensing and what you actually want the computer to do. So what I'm doing in my work is getting rid of this, getting rid of as much of this as we possibly can, and instead getting the person building the system to build a system through examples of data. Um, and there's two main types of data that are really easy to get from a person building a new system. One is examples of inputs, examples of data streams that they expect to see in the future in this, this real-time system. Another is examples of outputs. Here are the sorts of things I want the computer to ultimately do. Um, one approach, obviously, if we're going to use machine learning, one approach is to use supervised learning, where we actually ask people to pair these two things together. And that's been the majority of the work that I've done in this space, although not all of it. So, if you're not a machine learning person, here's my supervised learning in a nutshell slide. Right? We have some algorithm, and the algorithm builds the model. So we don't have a person building the model anymore, but it's still just a function. Right? And the algorithm builds this function from a set of training examples. And each training example has uh, a set of example inputs, for instance, hand gestures. And each of these hand gestures is labeled with the output that I want my model to make for that input. And so we train our model, and if everything goes well, we can show it new inputs, new hand gestures, and the model will produce an appropriate output, in this case, sound one. And in many applications, we even want this to be robust to small changes in the input. So even if my hand doesn't look exactly the same as when I made my training set, um, it should give a reasonable classification. I'll come back to when this starts to get really interesting. OK, well, it turns out this process, you know, we can think about this as, yay, yeah, Machine learning algorithms are designed mathematically to do this really well. Um, and just that principle alone starts to make this a really useful tool for interaction design. Um, one of the first benefits we get 
is that we can produce models that are much better at generalizing to new inputs, being robust to see these changes in the input data. So this means that if we're going to use machine learning to build a gesture classifier, we can often build a gesture classifier that's more accurate in general. It's more robust to changes compared to even if we had the best programmer in the world sitting down and trying to write a function from scratch. Um, but there's some more interesting, uh, I would say additionally interesting, aspects of machine learning that make it a good tool for design. So second of all, um, we often do really have these very complex relationships um, between inputs and outputs in the data, right? where it might not be possible for any programmer to sit down and build us something that works. And machine learning can do that. But beyond that, by using this process, we've circumvented the need for somebody somewhere to sit down and write some program code. So first of all, this makes it possible for somebody who's not a programmer to go through this process. And I've you know, worked with kids as young as seven years old. And they can do this process. It's not that hard. It's easier than learning how to code. Um, but it also means that people who might be programmers can often do this process much more quickly. And that starts to um, drive some really substantial changes um, in the design process. If building something is easy, that actually changes the sorts of things that you build and the approach that you take to building them. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the software that I started making back in 2008, 2009, um, when I was a PhD student at Princeton. Um, and this software is called the Wekinator. So many of you here probably know Weka. It's a pretty nice off-the-shelf machine learning toolkit. And it's good for lots of different problems. It's also pretty easy for people who aren't machine learning experts to get and use. You know, They might have to read a textbook, but they can do something useful fairly easily. And I wanted to make something that was like Weka, but for real-time applications. So like Weka, the Wekinator is a software toolkit. It's a standalone piece of software. It runs in a user interface, graphical user interface. Doesn't require you to be a programmer. You never need to touch code. Um, it's also fairly general purpose. It gives you a set of algorithms for classification and regression and temporal modeling that work for a lot of different problems. Um, furthermore, it's compatible with pretty much any type of sensor or game input or you know, computer vision or audio analysis system um, on the input side. And you can connect it up to code that's written in any programming language on the output side. It works nicely with music synthesis engines and game engines and animation environments and so on. OK, so it's very much in the spirit of Weka in those senses. However, um, it runs in real time, which Weka doesn't in the user GUI version of it. Um, more interestingly, we found out very quickly when we started this project that if we were going to build something useful, we had to address some of the differences between what machine learning means and how you do it well in an environment like Weka, where you've got offline data sets, you want to do a certain type of analysis and model building, versus in these contexts where you want to build a new gestural control system or a new musical instrument. All right, so um, I'm going to make the case throughout this talk that using machine learning to build these interactive systems is not exactly the same as building something um, with a tool like Weka. The first big difference that you run into is that you don't have training data out there. You need to collect the training data. If I want to make my hand gesture classifier, I can't go out on the internet and download the ground truth training set for you know, these hand gestures. It probably doesn't exist, right? But I can make that data set. I can just give it a bunch of examples um, and maybe collect examples from other people doing the same set of gestures. But I get to choose the gestures. Second difference is that if I'm building something like a hand gesture classifier, I'm often proficient enough in the application area under consideration that I'm qualified to take that model and say, I'm going to make some new hand gestures, and I'm going to see what it does. I'm not limited to saying, OK, I'm going to run cross-validation on uh, this data set and use that as a metric of model quality. I can actually just take it and say, well, what does it do when I do this? What does it do when I do this? I can get a much different approach to evaluating models that's going to give me different types of information. Um, and then third, I can start taking that information about what my model does well and what it doesn't do well, and I can use it to make changes, informed changes to the training data. So in the simple case, maybe I say, hey, my hand gesture classifier does really well in these two classes. Let's make the problem more interesting. Let's add a third class. Right? Why not? It's going to be more fun. 
Or I could say, if it doesn't do this gesture when I tilt my hand over to the side, why don't I just give it some more training examples of my hand tilting to the side? And I have a reasonable expectation that I might improve the model. So I know there are a bunch of people here who do interactive machine learning. Different people mean different things when they talk about interactive machine learning. I'm using the term the way that Fails and Olson used it in their CHI paper or WISP paper, IUI, one of those, about 10 years ago. Um, when I say interactive machine learning, I mean these, these types of things specifically in this context. All right, so before I give you a demo, I want to give you a good idea of what's going to be happening in the software that I show you. So um, once you've built a model with Weckinator, you can run it in real time. Um, and you just get a stream of feature vectors coming in. And these can be from sensors, from audio, from wherever you want. And it's going to output a stream of output vectors. And you can take these and send them to an animation program. You can send it to processing, or Unity, or sound synthesis environments, and so on. Doesn't matter. Um, all of this communication is done through a very nice, simple communication protocol called Open Sound Control. If you're doing real-time stuff and you haven't used Open Sound Control, I recommend it. It's like a very nice glue. Um, yeah, makes things easy. OK. Um, I mentioned that we might have more than one model at a time. For usability and debugging purposes, um, from the perspective of the end user, we're making one model per output. Right? So here, if I'm building a music system, I want to control volume and pitch and some filter coefficients and so on. Um, I'm going to separate each of these out into a different model that's completely independent from the others, because that means I can tune it independently if I want. And each of these models, I can use one or more of the available features. These models um, can be regression models, which I might use for something like volume. They could be classification models, which I might use for something like discrete pitches. Um, they can be um, models that do segmentation. I'm not going to talk too much about that in my talk, but we can talk about that later. Um, or if you're doing classification, you can get posterior probability distributions rather than just the single most likely label. And you can send this on, again, to whatever kind of environment you want to control. Um, if you're interested, these are the algorithms that are in the current version of Weckinator. They're all pretty standard. I didn't invent them. They're not specifically designed for interaction, although you could say that dynamic time warping is something that doesn't get used a lot in um, a lot of other contexts. Um, but they're pretty standard. OK, let's do some demos. So I'm going to open up Weckinator here. And I'm going to tell it, uh, first of all, I'm going to do one of my oldest demos for you. Dan Morris has seen this before, I think. And I'm going to make a classifier. I'm going to get 100 really, really bad computer vision inputs here. This is, I'm taking a webcam input from my computer, and I'm just chopping it into a 10 by 10 color matrix. And I'm taking the, I think the average brightness value in each of these cells and sending that as a 100 dimensional feature vector. So this is kind of a silly feature to use if you know anything about computer vision. But this is a lot like features that people use in practice all over the place. Right? It's kind of a first pass. I don't know anything about my data. I don't know anything about signal processing. I want to try to use machine learning to build something anyway. All right, so I'm going to t send it 100 um, features. And I want to control one classifier with four classes. All right, and I'm going to start a really, really simple drum machine. And this drum machine is going to play different sounds when I give it different class values. All right. And I'm going to train it, uh, give it a few examples of me standing here. I recorded 15 snapshots of me here. And I'm going to record some examples of me not standing there. So now I have 30 examples total. I'm going to train it and run it. And it's actually learned a pretty good me classifier. right? And I can start making it more complicated. I might say, here's my hand. Right. Still working pretty well. Let's see if I can make it make a mistake. No. <laughs> All right. Here it's, it's a little bit fuzzy in here. It's giving me, it's confused with my hand right here. So I'll give it more hand examples in this space. 
and I'll retrain it and run it. And now I'd say that that's, that's better. All right, so that's a really simple classifier with bad features with examples that I've just given it on the fly. OK, let's do a regression demo. Um, for this one, I've got a leap motion sensor here. And I've got a much better feature set. In this case, I've got um, using the hand skeleton data that I'm getting from the leap. And I'm just using the x, y, and z features of each fingertip. Right? So I've got 15 features total. And to do this, again, I'll say, listen for these 15 inputs. And let's control. Um, a physical modeling algorithm. So this, this algorithm that I'm going to show you is um, a very pretty high dimensional um, algorithm. It takes in something like 11 different control inputs and makes very different sounds depending on which inputs you give it. Um, it's not going to find it there. Where are we? There we are. OK, so I'm just going to cycle through some of the sounds for you to give you a sampling of this 11-dimensional sound space. Not with the drum in the background. OK, so that's just some pseudo random locations in the sound space. If I'm a sound designer or I'm a composer, my job is to find not just locations in this space that sound good or useful for an application, but trajectories through this space. I want sound to change over time in a way that makes sense, right? Which is musically expressive or fits um, the, the scene, the sound scene that I'm trying to design sound for, and so on. Um, and I want to control this with leap. So I'm actually constructing, in this case, I'm just choosing the nine most interesting parameters. And I'm constructing a 15 dimension to a nine dimension function. So this is a pretty complicated mapping function. Um, and I'm going to use Weconator's default, which is just off the shelf um, neural networks to do this. So what I can do is start out with a sound that I like more or less as a starting point. So we can start with that sound and say, I want that sound to be here. And then I might change the sound a little bit and say, maybe I want a higher sound up here. I'll give it some examples of that and train it. Oops. Am I getting data? OK, that didn't work for some reason. Let's try this again. Here's that. Something, somebody's unhappy here. Um, mm -hmm. Let's try that. Uh, we're not getting data for some reason. Let me, let me restart this. Not sure what's going on. If that doesn't work, we'll do a different demo. There we go. That should work. that something about the fact that the height of my hand corresponds to pitch, and I get a nice little slider. Not the most interesting thing in the world, but it's sort of a nice leap slide whistle. Um, I can start making it a lot more interesting if I give it different hand positions. So. So 
with this, you see suddenly I've really exploded the space of sounds that I can access. I still have some predictability in it. I know that I can make certain sounds over here and one sound over here, but I also can explore the space and start finding things that weren't, they don't sound anything like what was in my training data. Right? I can iterate on this process and say, all right, I like what it's doing over here, but I don't what it's doing over there. Let me put a different sound into the space over here and I can iteratively make this more complicated, giving it different sounds, giving it sounds that are more tailored to my aesthetic preferences, and so on. All right, so that's, in a nutshell, that's what a lot of um, composers do when they're using the system to make a new musical instrument. Um, does anybody have any questions about the demos before I move on? OK. So um, I, as I mentioned, the, I built the first version of Wekinator back in um, 2008, 2009. I've been using it with a lot of different people in different contexts since then, and also building new types of interfaces which aren't Wekinator specifically, but similar interactive machine learning interfaces for different applications. Um, some of the first people I've worked with in the space are really gifted um, computer music composers. And I have um, a demo of one piece, which is much better music than what I just showed you. Um, uh, and this is an example of somebody who's a professional composer who worked with this over the period of several months and built um, a piece which you're going to see here. And the, the sensors here are um, these game track real world golf controllers, which are supposed to be used to measure your golf swing, but you can pick them up and use them to measure 3D space of your hands, or 3D position of your hands in space. Um, what she's doing, what she really wanted with this piece was to have people doing something that was like the yoga sun salutation. Um, and she had a particular sound space that she wanted people to move through um, and smoothly move through as they were moving and, and also have slight differences between different performers. So she had a, a quite a clear conceptual idea of what the piece was going to do in the sound space and use Wekinator to turn this into something that um, felt like the right instrument for her for the piece. So I'll give you an, some video. So that's one video. The next clip I'll show you is um, another composer who is an early user of Wekinator who um, was walking down the street one day and found a piece of tree bark. And as you do, said, I want to turn that piece of tree bark into an instrument. And um, she put a bunch of light sensors in it and connected it to Wekinator and then to the same um, music synthesis software that I showed you earlier, Max MSB. And so this is her talking um, about the piece and you see a little bit of the instrument and hear it in the background. Basically taking the data and it's comparing it to examples that I've given it in the past of relationships between a certain data and a certain gesture and a certain sound. So if I train the machine learning software that when I you know, wrap my arms around the instrument and the sensors register less light, it makes a particular kind of sound. And then full light, it makes a different kind of sound. So I give it all these examples in the training process. Um, and then I run it and I see what happens and, and it, it takes the data that's coming in and says, oh, that looks just like the data or that's similar to the data that she wants, that she has when she wants this sound. So it sends that message to my sound processor and the computer outputs that sound. Um, so it's just another way basically of mapping gesture to sound. All right. I like that video because you can see the instrument, right? You can see the way that she's developed to play this instrument, but you also hear from her how she's thinking about machine learning and her understanding of machine learning as somebody who's, she's a composer. She's, you know, she's not a machine learning person in any sense. Um, so I've done quite a bit 
of work and still do uh, quite a bit of work with professional composers. Um, but I'm also working in a lot of other application contexts. Uh, I've used Wekinator quite a bit in teaching, teaching kids as young as seven, all through um, PhD level, um, both teaching them about sensors and how you use sensors, but also teaching them about interaction design. Right? This is a great way to get people started um, playing with new types of interacting with computers without first having to get them proficient in programming. And they can learn a lot by saying, all right, what happens if I connect this to this thing? And you know, what, what might I build? Um, I've had some projects recently building musical instruments uh, for and with people with different kinds, types of disabilities. Um, some of them look kind of like the instruments that you just saw, where it's really sort of experimental weird sounds. Some of them look and sound much more um, conventional. Um, I've done some work on building recognizers for existing vocabulary. So instead of just saying, hey, I want this thing to do something interesting, people coming in and saying, I have a, a pretty clear idea of what it is that I want the system to learn. Um, for instance, this is a cellist who had a um, sensor bow that she used with her cello. And she wanted to teach the computer to recognize when she was doing legato and staccato and spiccato articulations. And these are, you know, it's not a trivial learning problem, but if you can get the computer to recognize that, then you can build better computer accompaniment systems, for instance. Um, done a little bit of work on gesture recognition for rehabilitation and even research on human motor learning. Um, and right now, one of my main projects is working with developers at different startups and working with hackers and makers at things like Hack Days and building better prototyping tools for them. So um, the rest of my talk, I'm going to kind of give you a high-level tour of what I think are some of the most interesting findings of this research. But I'm happy to answer questions about any of these specific projects later if, if you have them. All right, so new perspectives on what, what good is machine learning as a design tool? How does it work? When does it work well? What's hard about it? Um, high-level finding here is maybe unsurprisingly, yeah, this kind of works. It works well for enough context that I'm still doing this work six years later. Um, the composers that I worked with, like the ones that you saw at the, at, in the videos, um, right away when I started doing participatory design processes with them to build the first version of Wekinator, it became obvious that, yeah, this is going to be useful. And the first thing it does is it makes the time to build a new instrument much, much faster, even for people who are expert programmers. And then secondly, people started talking about how the type of instruments that they were building was very different from the type of instrument that they were building when they wrote programming code. So I'll come back to this and talk about why I think that is. Um, also, we were able in very early work in this area to see that, yeah, somebody who doesn't know anything about machine learning but has some sensors, has some good feature extractors for that sensor, and knows how to make a gesture set accurately, um, they can build state-of-the-art quality classifiers. Right? This cellist was able to build a set of articulation classifiers that matched or beat the state of the art in published research on this topic. And she could do that because this process, I think, is pretty easy to understand and engage with, um, even if you're not a machine learning person. All right. The next thing that I want to highlight here is that you know, when I've observed people using Wekinator or logged the things that people are doing with the software, it becomes clear that you know, it's very rare that somebody says, OK, I'm going to plug in my sensor. I'm going to give it some data. I'm going to train a model. And then I'm, going to, I'm done. And I walk away with it. Right? There's a lot of iteration, a lot of people saying, all right, I'm going to try it out. Hmm, I like this. I don't like that. Let me change it. Build a new model. Try it out, and so on. And usually, you know, this is happening dozens of times right? in the simple cases. And it might happen hundreds or even more times for people building really you know, I'd say professional quality robust systems. So people are continually iterating, building new models, trying them out, modifying them. And in contrast to what people usually, I'd say broadly, usually do with a tool like Weka, when people have been using Wekinator to build new interactions, it's usually not changing learning algorithms or changing algorithm parameters or changing features. It's often changing the training data. Right? It's saying, I don't like this, so I'm going to give it more examples of what I really do want it to do for this type of, of input. Um, and I think it's constructive to think about the training data as actually a type of user interface here. Right? Instead of writing code, people are giving examples of what kinds of inputs they want to give to the model, what kinds of outputs they want the model to have. And this is the primary way they communicate their goals for what the system should ultimately do. 
Um, this is also often the way that people fix model mistakes by saying, hey, it didn't do what I wanted here. I'll give it more examples here. Um, and again, data, real-time streams of data is primarily the way that people evaluate whether they like a model or not. Right? If you think about, as I was moving my hand around with this trained model here, I'm learning quite a lot about you know, what sounds does it make where? Do I like it? Do I not like it? What else might I want it to do instead? And this is true for both these continuous mappings and for classifiers. Yeah? Um, so you said that you could, to fix the models, you could add more training data. Do you yeah. ever allow, allow them to like, remove? Yes, absolutely. So one of the most obvious useful things that uh, people requested and that I added was the equivalent of an undo button, right? To say, I just added a bunch of examples. It screwed everything up. Let me remove those. Um, in artistic contexts, people have been really interested in saying, can I, can I have it gradually remove the old data so I can actually impose sort of a concept drift on my model? And that uh, might be interesting in non-artistic contexts, but it's been useful for some people. So yeah, you can remove examples, certainly. Yeah? Like, um, so with the leap, not so much, but like with the camera and other yeah. things, like I wonder, like something that might be not obvious to users might be the, you know, how much the context of lighting or something totally changed the thing and totally worked at their desk and they Definitely. take it in the performance space yep. and they're like, oh my god, what's happening? Yep. Like, do you, do you see that and how do you help people like account for those things? Yeah, so um, up to this point, I haven't tried to build any tools that explicitly help people with that process. Um, certainly being able to have something that is really easy to just turn on and try out, at the very least you want somebody to, in their sound check in a new space, say, oh, this lighting is destroying everything, um, and hopefully make it easy enough that they can recover by you know, adding more examples in that space. So in practice, that's what people have done. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot more you could do there, and especially certain types of sensors where you have sensor drift or you have um, sensitivity to environmental conditions. There's, there's a number of cool ways that you might address that. Yeah, good. All right, um, one point, okay, two points I wanna make here before I move on. So first of all, thinking about the training data as an interface for doing these things makes sense, right? It's, you're gonna be able to do these more efficiently often by changing the data than you are gonna be by changing the learning algorithm or changing your SVM kernel or, or so on, right? So this is a pretty direct interface. It's something that people understand. Um, I have asterisks here next to goals because I, I do want to make the point that it's not that somebody comes to the table usually and says, I want to build a classifier that does exactly this. Um, or maybe they do, but often those goals change slightly over time. I'll come back to this. But if you're able to easily change the data, then that's OK. Right? You don't have to do anything complicated algorithmically. You just allow people to have a very lightweight, low overhead way to say, well, my, my idea for what I'm building has changed now. And it's OK. All right, which brings me to my next point, which is that I think when people have used Wekinator for really you know, serious projects, and I say, why in the world would you use this? It's a research piece of software. It's a little bit weird looking. And I think this is key to a lot of the success that people have had, which is allowing them to very easily instantiate a new working system, even if it's not perfect, allows them to prototype ideas quickly, right? The time from nothing to having something that does something is very short. You know, it could be 10 seconds, as you saw in my demo. Whereas doing that with programming, you might be talking about minutes, hours, days, weeks, right? So it allows them to say, all right, I think I have an idea. I'm not sure if this is a good idea. Let me try it out. Um, and when you allow people to do that with lots of different ideas, to say, I'm not sure what what gesture set I want to use, for instance, well, you're not stuck with the first one you try. You haven't sunk, sunk two weeks into it um, by the time you find out that maybe you're on the wrong track, right? You can explore lots of different ideas in parallel. Um, and for some applications, it's also important to be able to discover uh, behaviors that you didn't necessarily plan for. So these, these first two points, people have written about this, right? Ben Schneiderman has written about this. He talks about creativity support tools. Bill Buxton has written about this. Um, and we can talk about the importance of these activities in the context of, of wicked problems, right? If you guys haven't come across the idea of wicked problems, this is something that's been useful for, in shaping the way I look at this work, right? You can talk about problems in engineering, in design, in music, all sorts of things that people might want to do with sensors well, you don't necessarily know exactly what the specifications are until you've actually built the thing, right? You don't necessarily know 
what exactly is a really good gesture classifier for controlling this video game until you build it and you try it out, right? And probably you build it and you try it out and you say, well, that almost works, but this, there's this thing that I didn't consider, which is screwing me up and I need to fix that, right? So you, your understanding of the problem goal and the problem constraints change over time. And it's by instantiating different designs that you actually learn and you're able to get to your, your final design, um, not just more quickly, but you, as Bill Buxton says, right, you, you need to not just get the design right, you don't just implement your, your specifications, you're getting the right design, you're making sure you're building the right thing to begin with, right? And when you're able to build something really quickly and try it out, that makes this process easier. So I think when people have talked about, well, this is, allows me to build just a better interface than by programming, I think this is a lot of what is behind that. Um, and as I mentioned, sometimes, especially people building new creative systems, new musical instruments, um, they want to do more than this, right? They also want to not be constrained by their own imaginations, right? If I'm building a new leap motion sound exploration interface because I'm a sound designer and I want to find a good sound for you know, a particular scene um, in a game or a sound effect, um, I might not have in my imagination the best sound already. I want to be able to really efficiently explore lots of sounds and hear something that might surprise me. Right? And this is very hard to do if you start by writing code and say, I'm going to write a 15 to 9 dimensional mapping function. The easiest thing to do is to you know, make a linear function with some really simple translations and transformations. And then you're kind of stuck with it. Right? Whereas using this sort of example-driven paradigm, you can put very different sounds into your training set and, and get very different outputs. Um, so this is also something that people have talked about as being important to them in their choice to use this versus programming. OK, so these, I've been, been talking about a, a specific set of ways in which people and machines are really co-adapting in this process. And this is, I think, a really important point that took me a long time to realize, right? You, you think about machine learning from a conventional perspective, and you, you think about it as, OK, I'm going to try to build the very best model for this data set. You assume that your goals are embedded in that data set to an extent, and you just you want to build the best thing. Um, that's not often how the real world works. Um, so as I mentioned here, right, we're, we're not typically starting with ground truth data that's already been collected. Um, or if, even if we are, we often are able to go get more data to either test the model or improve the model. Um, there are lots of different concepts that you might teach an algorithm that are potentially useful. Right. Um, earlier today, we were sitting down and talking about building a shake detector for the micro bit, for instance. And there you could say, well, this is pretty simple. It's a pretty clear cut problem. Either you're shaking it or you're not. Well, yes and no, right? You could imagine, are you going to enforce the fact that everybody has to shake it with you know, sort of the, the LEDs facing up and they have to shake it back and forth, left and right? Or are we also going to allow people to um, shake it up and down? Or are we going to allow them to hold it any way they want? and shake it, right? Those are all different variations of the same is someone shaking it problem. And they're all going to have different implications for how hard it is to build a shake classifier. And they're going to have different implications for how easy to use that shake classifier is going to be, right? And so we can think about this design space as presenting lots of different potential trade-offs between the usefulness of the end model and the feasibility of making it. Um, and what you see, unsurprisingly, is that people navigate this space, right? They have a limited amount of time to build something. They have a limited amount of effort that they're going to build into it or put into building it. And at some point, they're going to make a judgment call and say, all right, this is good enough. Let me move on with my life. Obviously, right, when we're building tools, we want to make this, you know, we want to make it as easy as possible for people to build things that are as complex as possible. But at the same time, I think it's, it's helpful to think about um, this larger context. So for instance, um, I have a, a paper at AVI a couple of years ago where we tried to build a better tool to help people understand these trade-offs. Um, this is a tool for recognizing beatboxing, but other, also other types of vocalizations or sounds. And um, if you want to train a three-class classifier, we actually show you some information about the examples that you've recorded and how they might overlap in the feature space. Um, so this is one choice of three classes. This is a, another slightly different choice of three classes. 
And if you're a user, right, and you, we don't show people this because we're not working in a two-dimensional feature space, but we show people this, right? If you're a user, um, knowing this can help you understand the trade-offs. So say, well, I could either just work with this one because these are easily, more easily able to be classified, or I could work with this, but I have to redefine class B by changing the way that I perform it. Or maybe I have to be more careful in the type of training data I give it and give it better training examples with less noise. Or I have to come up with a better feature representation. Right? So there's, there's not one answer um, that's the best. It's going to depend on the person and the context. That kind of feedback seems like it would be really useful during the exploratory process with Wekinator. Because you can see someone getting into a yeah. call where there's like some example that really takes the model somewhere they didn't expect and they yep. have no way to inquire about yep. that. Have you folded back this kind of feedback to help people? Not yet. Not yet. But yeah, that's something that I would really like to do. Yeah. All right. A um, couple more points that I want to make before wrapping up. So um, another, I think, underappreciated benefit of using machine learning to make interactive systems is that it allows people to communicate very directly, hey, this is an embodied action that I want to take, or here's my embodied understanding of how what I'm doing relates to what the computer is doing. Uh, if you are building a tree musical instrument, for instance, um, it's going to be really hard for you to operationalize the relationship between the sensors and the sounds in a mathematical function. It's really easy for you to say, all right, here's what I want to be doing when I want the sound quiet. And here, this is something that's louder. You can, you can demonstrate that. And I think there's all sorts of other application domains in which people have tacit or embodied knowledge that they can um, provide much more easily than by writing program code. So this is another um, factor that I think has, has made people want to use this. All right. Um, interactive machine learning is different from conventional machine learning applications in a few ways that I think might be interesting for people who are machine learning folks in the room. First, most obvious thing that comes up is that the examples that people provide when they're building a classifier in this way, they're not IID, right? Um, and this is actually be a good thing. It means that we can learn really efficiently from small training sets. So this is sort of a conventional machine learning application. Imagine these are our two classes. We want to fit a decision boundary to this, right? You've all seen diagrams like this before. If someone has in their mind this decision boundary, um, what they often start doing is giving sort of canonical examples of each class. And then they train a model and say, where does that boundary end up? Right? And when they start testing it, they start testing the canonical ones as well as things that might be closer to the boundary. And they're going to notice right away that there are a few examples that appear on the wrong side of that boundary. And they're going to feed those back into the training set and immediately get a much better classifier. But they didn't have to go through the process of giving all these other examples that are, actually aren't that informative to the ultimate model. Um, this makes things a little bit hairy, though, because when you don't have IID data, then things like cross-validation accuracy start to become problematic. Um, and in fact, in the, the Cello study that I mentioned, we looked at the relationship between cross-validation accuracy of the models that she was making and her own satisfaction with the models. In an ideal world, you'd want those to be positively correlated. Uh, we found that they were negatively correlated. So um, and, you know, we can talk about why that is, but it kind of makes sense. All right, the last point I'm going to make may be controversial, but uh, I'm going to claim that gesture recognition, gesture classification, is often the first thing that comes to mind for people who want to build a new system with sensors. Right? It's, hey, I want to like, wave my hand and uh, turn my TV on, or I want to you know, do this, and my, my drone is going to turn right. And um, you know, that's cool. Um, but a lot of times, this raises problems. Right? This is a, a finite gesture set. It, makes you behave in a sort of rigid, prescriptive way. There's not a lot of room for error. You've got to memorize the gestures. Um, you feel like you're making mistakes when things go wrong. And what I always ask people is, OK, is there a good reason that you're not doing this with a button? Because buttons are really good for certain things. If there's a good reason, then fine. You know, Go build yourself a gesture classifier. But um, in a lot of other cases, building something that might be more like um, a cello Right, where you have continuous multi-dimensional control that allows you to explore, where you can form an understanding of what the interface allows you to do and learn how to play it in a way that might be idiosyncratic to you, it's often much more satisfying. 
Um, and uh, our CHI paper for last year, we, we looked at this a little bit. We compared using end user training of classifiers for people with disability, disabilities with um, pre-training really high dimensional continuous control spaces that feel kind of like this leap thing here. So, right? so we'd, we'd build an interface that makes a sound no matter what you do with it. And as you move a little bit, the sound changes, right? And that's it. And gave it to people with very different types of physical constraints. And actually observed that people ended up coming up with discrete gesture sets on their own. Everybody had an idiosyncratic way of playing it. And they would come up with these sort of riffs um, gesturally that would result in sonic riffs. So in the end, everybody had a bespoke computer music instrument. Um, but everybody was able to do something that was very comfortable. And because they were exploring this space, they were able to build up a gesture set for themselves that didn't require them to sit back and, and memorize it. Um, so that was an interesting outcome of that. OK. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, anybody can use this. As I mentioned, I've used it with seven-year-olds. Um, it helps experts as well. But I think uh, we're on our way to making this much more um, effective. All right. We don't have too much time, um, so I'm going to leave it there and open it up for questions. <laughs> so many people. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take your question, because we're going to talk. But I'll come back to you, Ofer. Dan. Do you, do you know if anything looks sort of like this piece where it has been commercially deployed? Like I imagine somebody like Leap, for example, yeah. has the super high dimensional data space, and they're trying yeah. to put it out in the developer's hands who've never seen it before. Yeah. And how did that go? So um, that is the third next slide that I was going to mention briefly. Um, well. Not a lot of people have been commercially deploying this. But I'm working with four startups right now around Europe who are trying to put this into products. And so we're actually studying their process of doing this and trying to figure out how to best support them. Where, where the end users are, in the model I was talking about, where people leave, the end users aren't really end users, the end users are other software developers. That's yes and no. So we're, we're actually looking at both Yeah, in this context, where, for instance, um, um, oh, I didn't even have them on there. Sorry, five startups. The one that I left off is making um, uh, an app for sound designers where the end user will be customizing. Yeah. So ask me in a year. Yeah. So uh, especially from my background, thinking in the biosmal space, it seems like feature extraction is a huge and yep. part of this. Yes. Um, how have you tackled that in the past? Like if you take a seven-year-old and they want to do you know, assessment of something phonic, right? Yeah. How, how do they solve the problem of extracting a, yeah. a, so, a um, special feature? Yeah, so my first pass into that, and this has also came up really when we were working with Plux, who does um, sort of an Arduino-like platform for biosignal acquisition. The first thing we just did was say, well, let's wrap everything up in a GUI and give people visualization and give people the sort of drop-down ability to add um, you know, filtered features and look at your peak detection and that kind of thing. Um, it's better than nothing, um, but it's not something that we've had a chance to really rigorously explore. And I think we've been talking about this a lot the last few days. That I think there's so much stuff you can do to make that easier. Um, yeah, I'd love to do more of that. Interesting. And on that same thread, I mean, I was thinking about the same thing, but I'm wondering that, like, you know, you think about, like, as, you know, it's like a guitarist or a keyboardist, like, you, you kind of get to know, like, oh, these are the kind of effects pedals I have to have different mm -hmm. kinds of, like, output sounds. You can imagine people learning a space of, like, oh, I need something speechy and, like, I need this package, which gives me, like, you know, like, the textual features or something. Mm -hmm. and, um, you can see that becoming a part of their vocabulary, that there are libraries of features that they need to use to yep. do certain kinds of things. Yep. Yeah. So you mentioned how you, you train these models, and, and rather than using a metric, sometimes it's just how it feels to you and how important it is that it feels right to you. Yeah. Um, how much does that transfer across users? Like, is this my instrument and it's yeah. right for me, or, or does that? Yeah, so I think, I think that's a great point. And certainly, once you have something that is meant to translate across users, um, for certain applications, you know, it's OK to have the developer say, well, here's my gesture set. And to some extent, if I want it to be recognizing these hand signals, I'm going to train it the best I can and um, you know, assume that other people are going to adapt to make those gestures the same way. And they're going to learn how to control the thing accurately. Obviously, that, that breaks down at some point some near point where you want to give people better ability to test it out um, on data from people who aren't 
themselves and to notice, hey, my sensor like really doesn't work well on people with hand sizes that are different. Um, and again, that's something that we haven't explicitly um, started working with, but I think there's a lot you could do there either to give people better understandings of how deployment is likely to, ha <laughs> to work or to use something like you know, transfer learning to allow end users to further adapt something that's been pre-trained. Yeah. Have you played uh, gestures that are more temporal in nature of paths? Like yes. Are, yeah, so I skipped that part of the talk, but um, mm -hmm. one of the things that I've been doing over the last year or so is looking at different, um, basically, path recognition algorithms. The, the easy w way to do that and the way that's built into Echinator this version is dynamic time warping. And I've got some um, sort of specially configured dynamic time warping um, methods that work pretty well for a lot of different sensors. Um, there's a postdoc who just finished with us at Goldsmiths who was doing some um, uh, other, other techniques based on um, simplified Markov model where you don't need a lot of tra training data to set the transition probabilities. And that gives you furthermore the ability to have an idea of where in the sequence you are at any given time. Um, so I think that's super useful as well. Um, yeah. Ofer, do you want to ask your question? <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> I was, when you were describing one of your demos, uh, you said that you're just using the default regression algorithm, yep. which was a neural network. Yep. And, and, and it seemed like you were kind of, you know, brushing that off as an obvious, you know, I'm just using the default. But yep. it seems that if what the goal of the people is to uh, explore the space, mm -hmm. right, and I use two different algorithms. So maybe I have a nearest neighbor algorithm versus yep. a neural network. Yep. And maybe they will both do a good job of learning my gestures, yep. but they will interpolate differently, and yep. certainly they will extrapolate Yep. You know, to, to yep. far away points much, much differently. Definitely. Uh, another example is if you're, if you're regularizing your neural network parameters, if you regularize very aggressively, maybe it will be a very simple linear mm -hmm. interpolation. If mm -hmm. you let the thing go wild and start from random point, yep. you could move through many, many different states as you yep. move from one to another. So, yep. But that would imply that you need to expose something about the algorithm or the regularization parameter or some of the machine learning internals to the artist. Yes and no. Yes and no. I think the one of the first things that I found um, when building the first version of Wekinator is that people get really kind of turned off by having to explicitly make decisions about what algorithm to use or what parameterization to use. So one of the things I spent a lot of time on was saying, okay, what's a, what's a, what's a good default algorithm for classification or regression? What are good, what's a good default neural network architecture for the kinds of sensors and applications people are using? And then I didn't have ever see the word neural network on the screen when I loaded up the program and trained one. So you can happily coast along without ever doing that. I think you know, that's not optimal. And certainly, people are missing out on opportunities to get better performance if they're never changing the algorithm. So one of the things you know, I forgot to mention, I'm teaching a MOOC um, starting in a few weeks about machine learning for artists and musicians. One of the things I'm exploring in that MOOC is how to get people to have a good intuitive understanding of how their choices of algorithms and parameters are going to affect the model. So without having to you know, know calculus and take a machine learning course, you can still, with some human training, make better decisions about things. So that's one side of it. At the same time, I think there's a lot that could be done without having to train people by allowing people to instantiate multiple alternatives to say, here's my, here's my classification training data set. Um, hit train, and now I want, you know, I want to get three or five or ten models out. And I don't necessarily need to know which one is which, but I can try the first one. And if I don't like it, I can try the second one. And that's just another option that's there in addition to just training, changing the training data. And especially at some point, when people are really happy with their training data set, you kind of converge to something that needs to feel a little bit more like, like Weka, where you're happy with the data, now it's time to, you know, explore the, the space of, of algorithm configurations. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Well, thank All right, thanks a lot, guys.